Shalom Aleichem, welcome everybody back to the Shari Tshuva Chabora. Okay, so this is the Sefer we're using. You can go back, I don't know what, uh, I think we're in like uh, Lesson 21. Whatever it is, I'll just tell you the paragraphs, right? We're still in Shar Aleph. We're in paragraph 43, which is very short, so don't miss it. <laughs> 43, 44, and Bezrat Hashem 45. They're chock full of principles, fundamental principles in Judaism, in understanding the Bible, and understanding the Tanakh. And, um, okay, so here we go. I'm going to put the book back on the shelf. I have photocopies in front of me, and that's how I uh, use, that's, the, that's my notes, basically. So, for those that are familiar with that book and have that particular safer, we're on page 103. Again, we're still, doesn't matter what book you're using. Uh, we're in Shar Aleph, 43, paragraph 43. Now, before we begin, I do want to say that last, um, last week we were praying for uh, Rabbi Tversky, who passed away. Very sad. Um, broke Diane uh, Emmett. He went on to the next world, no questions. He is, he's there, man. He was there while he was here, right? Unbelievable. Um, Amud, you know, a pillar of the Jewish community for the last 90 years, you know? Like, ever since he was a youngster. You know, he was, what a dynasty that he came from, and he left over, Baruch Hashem, thank you. Many, many people. Anyway, we, we had prayed for his Rafur Shlema. Happened to, he passed away during the class. Okay, so with the learning that we that we did, we hope that helped his neshama. I'm sure he didn't really need it, but uh, we also are constantly dedicating the Shirim to the Rafur Shlema of Rav Pinto. His Hebrew name is Yoshiyahu Yosef. Uh, ben Zachri. Okay, so Bezrat Hashem, through our learning tonight, today, wherever you are in the world, whenever you're watching this, we'll continue to assist his Rufu Um Now, let's start with 43. So the idea here is praying, praying for heavenly assistance. Now, I want to mention that in our own Shmona Esrei, in our silent prayer, uh, the repetition as well, the fifth blessing is we're asking Hashem to actually help us return. Hashivenu avinu lo right? Cause us to return, our Father, to your Torah. The karvenu makenu secha, and bring us close, our King, to your service. We want to serve Hashem properly, and bring us whole, back wholeheartedly before you. Right, blessed are you, Hashem, who wrote Seb Shuva, who desires, who wants. We already know that's what he wants, and we're asking for his assistance. So that's a prayer. It should mean something to you. After re after going through however many chapters, already now in the forty third chapter. But you know what? Prayer's not enough. Yeah, we have to do something. There's actions, and that's what this book. That's what this book. This chapter is referring to the prayer, but it's not going to be enough. But let's start with the prayer, okay? What we're going to be dealing with is that let's say, for example, we're going to get into these through the class. How capable are we of making full restitution or complete change we have to apologize to people. Who said they're going to accept our apology? Who says that their feelings will be uh, pacified? There's no telling. We can do what we have to do, and then the rest, we're, we're, who, like, where is it? Right? Who's going to help us? So that's what we're going to get into this idea. You have to do everything you can, but who says that's enough? So here it goes. V'od yit. Yitpalel ba'al teshuva el Hashem tamid. Furthermore, what we, what a ba'al teshuva needs to do is to constantly imagine. Okay, we pray three times a day, but do you take your prayers with you after you finish praying? Like, did it move you? Did it change you? Can you? I'm asking a serious question. You know, what is meditation? Because that's really what prayer is. 
So hopefully it's a, it's a moment of time that we're in touch with a truer or higher reality. And the goal is to take that moment, seize the moment, and take it into the rest of the day with us, right? As you go through your day, you think about all those things you, you actually spoke about, that you prayed about, that you asked about, that you dreamed about, that you aspired for through 24, or let's say, because you're sleeping, however many hours you sleep, I have no idea. But let's assume the average person sleeps, you know, seven, eight, nine hours, I don't know, let's say eight hours. So you still have another, whatever it is, 16 hours. I mean, is that right? Did I do my calculation correctly? You have 16 waking hours. I mean, you know, what are you going to do with them? He says you have to constantly pray, right? It's not that's just he said. Those set times are for the Shimon Esrei. But the Gemara even says, Halavai, that we should be praying all day long. So that's just one idea. Now, there is a note. One must pray for Hashem's assistance in fulfilling all the principles of tshuva, because that without Hashem's assistance, one cannot overcome the Yitzhara. Just imagine what it says in the Gemara in the Talmud, that Hashem did, He created the cure before He created any disease. And that's true in every case, even with, am I allowed to say it, you know, even with the present circumstances. Okay? So He created the Torah... Before he even created the Yetzahara. Yeah, Hashem created the Satan. Hashem created all those forces that work against, I, I, I won't even say him, that work within us to give us the free choice, right? We have free will, we have free choice. That's the greatest gift that God gave us so that we can earn our own Haba, so that we can earn, actually, not just earn it, but treasure it and feel that it has value. Because there was action on our part, right? To fight against our urges, our inner urges. Okay? So the Yetzirah, without Hashem's assistance, it says in the Gemara, if you don't have God's helping you, you'll never overcome it. Now, so what does that even mean? He's there for you. He's ready to help you. But it's got to come, the initiation. The, the Is that the word I'm looking for? To, to initiate to start, to jumpstart, to have the desire. Hashem will lead you exactly the way you want to go. You want to go in the correct path? He will lead you. He will even make it easier for you, right? Because that's your desire, to go in that direction. Well, guess what? The same thing is true the other way, which, you know, I don't want to talk about, right? If you really wanted to become a criminal, an uh, evil person, Hashem will lead you that way too. So Hashem will lead you in the way you want to go. The Pusik, the verse we're going to deal with is in Jeremiah. Yirmiyahu 31, 17. So it's only the last few words that we're going to focus on. But I'll read the whole verse. I have indeed heard Ephraim complaining, saying, You have chastised me, and I was chastised as an ungoaded calf. Now these are the words he wants us to hear. Oh, lead me back, and I will return for you, capital Y-O-U, are the Lord my God. Hashivenu, we're requesting, Hashem, lead us back, bring us back. Vashuva, and then I will return. Kiata Hashem Elokai, because you are the Lord my God. I'll tell you the truth. This is as far as chapter 43 goes. <laughs> But it's fundamental. So what did we learn so far in this chapter? This short, I think it's the shortest chapter we've read so far. Uh, just a few lines. That's why we're going to cover three chapters today. Because I'm not going to say 43 doesn't count. We, we could talk a lot. And we are going to talk about um, 43 a lot more as we go along. Because it's really a f foundation for the next <coughs> two as well. So... He just mentions in the footnote about the prayer we just read in the Shemona Esrei. That this is, let's just say, that's the, that, just start there, right? You have to have the desire. Now, 44. The next three segments, which we're only going to deal with two of them, uh, are also a grouping. So, Hashisha Asr, the 16th principle. Tikun Hamu'ut Ba'asher yocha litikon. Litikon, sorry. So basically, to, in order to fix something that is not straight, to fix something that is already bent, 
basically, the idea here is rectifying a wrong to the, the most possible extent that it can be rectified. We discussed this idea before. If you had a piece of wood, and for many years it was just bent, right? It was leaning against the wall and it was bent. How are you going to straighten it out? It, it doesn't matter how many times you just try to straighten it out, it's not going to work. It actually has to be bent in the other direction for a X amount of period of time, whether you need heat, whether you need moisture, I don't know. But eventually it will go to the center. But just by trying to straighten it normally, it's not going to work. It must be bent in the other. There's effort. There has to be friction, okay? There has to be some effort. So this is the idea. Ke'inu <clears throat> To whatever extent we could do it, we should. And like it says, by Ninveh, by the people of, I don't know where it is, modern-day Iraq, maybe on the border of Turkey, wherever Ninveh is, Yona, chapter 3, verse 10. Now we're going to read chapter 3, verse 10, but then we're going to go back to chapter um, the same chapter, but verse 8, two verses earlier. He put it in this order for a reason. I don't know why. I would have put it in, synch- what do you call it, um, in chronological order, but okay. He has his reasons that to rectify the wrong that one did is a critical component component of tshuva. What happened in Ninveh, chapter 3, verse 10? V'yar elokim et ma'asehem. God saw their actions. Kishavu midarakam hara. That they returned. That they actually transformed. They, did, they changed their behavior from their evil way. He used the word shavu. Shavu means re- repented. They actually repented. How do we know? Look back two verses earlier. At the very end of ver- verse 8. I'll just read the whole verse, but we'll focus in on the last few words. And they shall cover themselves with sackcloth. That's obviously uh, to, to um, motivate them to do tshuva. Maybe it's even part of tshuva both man and beast, and they shall call mightily to God, so crying out in prayer, maybe confession, and everyone shall repent, that's the words, of his evil way and the dishonest gain which is in their hands. This is implying, let's say if there was stealing involved, right? Theft. That means to return the objects that you stole. This is part of the tshuva process. So what we're going to discuss now is the idea of, there's, we already said there's harata, right, in the beginning, right? You have this regret. What about confession, right? That's also necessary. And the third, basically, was conviction never to do it again. But what about the part of returning or changing the action? Where, where does that take place? He's going to explain this is important to take place before the confession. Remember, the confession is to Hashem. Now, before we read that, I just want to go through another, um, just a, what's the word? Uh, a little bit of a summary. So what we're going to address is, before asking for forgiveness, you still have to address the actual damage that, ha- that had been done. And this safer here, I mentioned, is a fantastic book. This is written by Rabbi Asher Baruch Wegbright. You can buy this online, I think Amazon, whatever, Feldheim. Uh, he teaches in our Beit Midrash, Baruch Hashem. And he wrote a fantastic book, and I'm, I'm going to quote a few things from it before we get into this chapter. So let's say you, right, when you were working in the king's palace, and you dirtied the king's palace. So before you ask the king for forgiveness, wouldn't it make sense that you clean the palace before you ask him for forgiveness? Makes a lot of sense. So... When it comes to transgressions, there's going to be two types, right? Between man and God, there's nothing really to clean up. In other words, when it comes to what you did to Hashem. Hashem is not a human being that feels hurt or damaged. You didn't affect Him. There's no real true effect in God, right? There's nothing chaser, there's nothing lacking. Nevertheless, there's a certain thing we have to do. And what about when it comes to transgressions between man and man? That, obviously, people have emotions, anguish, or whatever, and um, they are affected by our actions in a real way. So he sums up in these two different paragraphs, look, when it comes between man and God, there's nothing we can actually do to repair the damage. There's no damage. But we have to experience this sincere regret 
and have our own serious anguish over our misdeeds. Now, what about when it comes to man against man? So we, we must repair the situation as much as possible. And now we're going to talk about not, what happens when it's impossible. <laughs> Maybe I should give an example. Okay. There's a halacha that if I stole, I, I'm using myself as an example. Let's not use that. Somebody stole, Mr. A stole something from Mr. B. Okay. So he should return exactly what he stole, right? Fine. What about if it's money? There's no such thing as the exact money, right? It's the exact amount, but you don't have to replace the exact dollars. They're going to be used, right? That's what they're used for. To be. Okay, so that, that, that's understood. You just have to replace the value. And in case it was, let's say, eaten, right? It's consumables or it was broken. You're right, I have to replace the value. What if, about, what if I stole iron and used it for beams in my house? And it's like the, it's the major beam that's holding up my whole house. And now I do tshuva, right? Wouldn't it mean that I have to take the beam out of my house? I have to destroy my whole house just to return the beam? So there, you don't have to. Meaning, you, you have to return the value. You don't have to take your house apart to return the beam. And the reason why... Hashem knows, the rabbis knew, because if you were required to take your house down to return that exact beam, you'd probably not do tshuva at all, <laughs> right? You're saying, no way, no way, no how. I'm not going to do it. It's too much, It's whether it's the anguish or the, the, the financial loss, whatever it is, it's just not going to happen. So, isn't that amazing? Okay, but what does it mean? It means that the halacha is you don't have to return the exact beam. You just have to go out and buy him another beam of equal value or give him the money. Fine. But what he's going to suggest is that one should anyway, even though it's not the letter of the law, the letter of the law does not require you to go and replace the exact beam. Nevertheless, it seems, from what he's saying, if you want to do tshuva properly, right, this whole idea of not having to take your house down and return the exact beam is to allow people to do tshuva, because if we said you had to return the exact beam, many people wouldn't do tshuva. Here you're already in the process of doing tshuva. You already want to do the right thing. So wouldn't it make sense? Go ahead and, <laughs> okay, do it whatever you could to replace the exact beam and give it back to him. It's obviously not required, but what about Lashon Hara? Here's another example, and there's a great story, and I, I was thinking about reading it. I'm not very good at reading these stories, but you'll get the idea. It's told in many different names. I heard the name of the Chavetz Chaim here. It's on the Chabad website about some, some other rabbi, but a certain person who is known to be a Yenta. A Yenta is, you all know what a Yenta is? A yenta is a Baal Lashon Hara. Someone who goes around, he tells stories about people, and everyone knows if you want to know what's happening, go and ask him what's happening about the certain neighbor. Well, apparently something did happen in the town, small little town, and word got out, and the rabbi says, uh-huh, we want to, we want to, we want to stop this, you know, this, these rumors. Let's go and speak to Mr. A, and we'll find out what's going on, and, uh, you know, that he should stop talking about anyway bottom line is the guy wants to do tshuva right he says yeah it was me whatever I, I start rumors once you tell one person they tell another people and on and on so we had like do tshuva he says go bring a pillow so he brings a pillow he says now go up to the mountain rip it apart and the guy's thinking to himself wow that's easy I'm going to do tshuva for all my Lashon Hara. I'm going to go to the top of this mountain. I'm going to do exactly what the rabbi says. I'm going to rip this pillow apart and let all the, the feathers, it's a feather pillow, let them all, that just, it's pretty simple. So he goes out, he buys this feather pillow, he goes up to the mountain, and he says, Rabbi, I'm finished. I did my tshuva. Now the rabbi says, now you have to go back and collect every feather. Well, are you kidding me? It's impossible. He says, that's what you did. Now you have to realize the severity of your sin. Just helping him understand the severity of his sin. You spoke Lashon Hara. Once you open your mouth and let it go, it's gone. You, you can't retract it. It's very difficult. It's almost impossible. 
but just understand the severity. Of course, if you know people you spoke bad about, you have to apologize to them, uh, rectify the anguish on their part. But so we need to ask Hashem for help, even if it's, of course, against him, but how much more so against other people that we really do tshuva. You can go to someone and say, even three times, let's say the guy says, no, I'm not accepting your apology. Okay, there's certain cases where you have to go more than once. And if the person doesn't accept it, what are you going to do? You need to beg Hashem that he opens the person's heart, that he forgives you. Okay, so there is a certain aspect of realizing on your own there's only a certain amount you can do. And Hashem is there for you. Okay, so we will get into David Melech. I'm sorry. Yeah. Not yet, not yet, not yet. That's the fifth, 45th chapter. So we're in 44. Here we go. So we just mentioned in Yonah, chapter 3, verse 10. We did verse 8, the last part. And what basically happened? God saw their deeds, that they had repented from their evil means, and evil way, and they took whatever necessary steps it was to rectify. Because as the verse says, at the end of the passage, they, they already returned from their evil way from the ill-gotten property that was in their hands. Okay? That was a necessary step before, uh, the, the, before the last step, before God um, saw that they repented. That was part of the process. Ki bedvarim sheben adam lechavero kamo hagezo vechamas so examples, things that take place between man and his fellow, like thievery or um, seizing property by force. Lo yitkaper avono adasher yashiv es hagzela. Right, the the full atonement for the sin is not really going to take place. You're not going to be forgiven until you you, re- you return the stolen items. V'chein im tzi'er et chavero v'heitziklo. So too, if you caused pain or any type of anguish to another human being, o hilbein panav, or you caused his face to go white, as hilvein means, you embarrass somebody, you caused him to die a thousand deaths of embarrassment. O sipra lav lashon hara, or if God forbid, again, you spoke lashon hara about him, you're not going to find atonement until you make the effort to request and try to appease him. You want forgiveness from him and receive it. So too in Baba Kaman 92a, then it's brought down. There are five types. You know, the whole concept of insurance is in the Bible. You're aware of this, right? That if, God forbid, you cause somebody physical pain, you have to pay him insurance, right? This is what insurance is all about. You have to pay him the... the, the, um, You have to rectify by paying him for the pain he experienced. And physical pain, we're talking about emotional pain as well. Uh, Unemployment benefits, right? If he's out of his doctor bills... Right? There's actually five things. So let's nezik, the actual damages. That's for any physical damage. Um, pain, suffering, healing, doctor bills, unemployment, unemployment. He's out of a job until he heals. And humiliation. Okay. So keep this in mind, that you want to do tshuva, you, you will have to, just like by theft, so too by other misdeeds as well. And we have a verse in Genesis chapter 20, verse 7, by Avimelech. You know, Avimelech took Sarah. Okay, Avraham was obviously quite upset. Um, nevertheless, listen to the verse. It's 20, verse 7 in Genesis. The auto, Hashev Esesaish, Esesaish, Ki Navihu Vit Palel Baodcha Vechaye. So, so now return, God's telling him, right? So now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet. But this is the latter part of the verse. He will pray for you and you will live. 
what would make Avraham pray? Obviously, an apology, right? Some kind of rectification for the anguish that he caused, caused Avraham. So, I know it doesn't say it, but this is implied in the verse. I'll read the comment because I think it's quite um, necessary. Hashem said this to Avimelech, king of the Philistines, who had taken Avram's wife, Sarah. The, the passage states in verse 16 that when Avimelech returned Sarah, he gave Avraham money. He gave him a thousand silver pieces as what is called eye covering, but it really means to compensate for Sarah's humiliation. Nevertheless, Hashem told him that he also needed Avraham's prayer in order to live. So what would that help? Let's say you know the person you just hurt needs to pray for you. What are you going to do? You're going you're gonna to compensate them. You're going to say, hey, uh, here's a, I don't know, a lollipop, right? Here's, here's something, a new car, right? That is, he needed to receive a full personal forgiveness from Avram to the extent that Avram would actually pray on his behalf. This is like appeasement. Even the word appeasement is a beautiful word. In Hebrew, right, the, a pious is lottery. It's used for lottery. But the, the where did it begin? I'm just off, like, go on the, we have a ramp. By the way, it's Parshas Mishpatim, right, we're in now. You're supposed to have, in the last week's Parsha, the very last few words, the last few lines, are you need to have a ramp that goes up to the altar, and then you have Elam Mishpatim, fine. So, Basically, that's the end of Parshas Yisra. So, one of the ideas, where was I going with this? One second. The word appeasement. So, unfortunately, in our history, we had a certain period of time where there was a Kohen who was killed by accident. What happened was the Tumas of the Deshen, the, the ashes that were left from the night before, it's a very dirty job. Who wants to clean the ashes from the barbecue pit? But guess what? Whoever, whichever Cohen would clean those ashes would become a millionaire, would be guaranteed income for the rest of his life. So there was a lot of pushing and shoving. You can imagine what a what a schut, what a what a great merit to, to so they had all the young guys were chasing after this opportunity. And unfortunately, as they were running up the ramp, maybe one of them was pushed off and tragically died. So the rabbi said, at the time, we're talking about the sages, this is probably the first temple. I'm not sure if it was the first or second temple. But what happened, they decided there would be a lottery, a pious, that, that's the word, to appease, right? Interesting. And it really means peace, peace, to bring peace to the situation because it ended tragically and we didn't want it to happen again. And so they made these sticks. You take, you know, in your hand and everyone picks a stick and I guess it's the short stick or the long stick, whatever stick is different than everyone else's stick, he's the one who would merit. So just the word pious is from the word appeasing, which is really to bring peace, right? So that's what you want to that's what you want to do. Okay. We are, if I'm not mistaken, we just talked about what it mentioned in Genesis chapter 20, verse 7, that Avimelech had to pray for, um, had, had, had to try to appease Avraham so that Avraham would pray for him. Okay, so I just want to go through another, let's just see, I have a few comments here. No. Okay, so let's go to 45. This is going to be the real meat and potatoes of the class. This is the longest chapter that we're going to deal with tonight, today, this morning, as I said, wherever you are. Okay, 45. He's stressing here that before you even do um, the confession, the best thing is to do the rectification, the appeasement, or whatever it is that you need to do. Um, this is in order to appease your fellow and to, in order to receive his forgiveness even before saying the confession. Right? 
because it's not about you're not we don't confess to people we confess to Hashem so when you're finally going to come and speak to Hashem th there should already be quite a lot of the rectification already done this is on your part right our job is not yet complete you think it's so easy just to confess to Hashem before you get there and we're going to learn such a tremendous story of uh, um, lesson from a story about Dov and Amalek. V'dovet alav shalom and regarding King David, peace be upon him, be'es teshuva, at the time of his repentance. And this is in chapter 51 of Psalms. Cain also kodam avidoi, he made the efforts before he confessed to Hashem. Look at Psalms chapter 51 verse 6. He says, to you alone did I sin. Now, for those who aren't aware of King David's sin, it's not as X-rated as you may have thought. King David never slept with a married woman. In fact, he didn't even sleep with Bathsheba until after everything was said and done. He inquired of her. He found out she was a married woman. It's true. He asked, he commanded, he's the king, for Uriah, Uriah to come back from the front line. And anybody who does not obey the king is what we call in Hebrew, Chai of Misa. He is to be put to death. It's a death penalty. This man was very patriotic. He says, listen, they need me on the front lines or they need me at the front. So King David should have put him to death himself through the Sanhedrin. He had the right as the king, anybody who's marred by Malchus, anyone who goes against the king, and he sent him further into the front lines, and there he died. So King David didn't kill him. It wasn't murder, but he caused that he should die through the non-Jews, the enemy, as opposed to the rightful Sanhedrin, that should have put this person to death. So he didn't sin against Bathsheba. He didn't sin against Uriah. He sinned against God. It says, to you alone did I sin. Clear as mud? And the evil in your eyes did I do. Okay? Laman... We're going to focus on this word Laman a little bit later, but keep this in mind, in mind now. Laman. What does Laman mean? In order that, Titzdak, Bidavracha, in order to, what's Tzedek, Tzedaka, in order that your words should be charitable, right? It will be charitable when you speak. Tizke Bisaftecha, and meritorious, a merit in your judgment. We don't know where he's going with this yet, but he's going to say perush. What does this verse mean? The first part of the verse, you alone did I sin, means like this. To you alone I'm considered a sinner. Truth is, if any one of, if any one of us would have done what King David did, we would not even be considered a sinner. Only on somewhere on the highest level would, right, you like Moses, what, do you think he was punished because he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock? We're not going to go there right now, but just keep this in mind. The bigger, Binyam, um, I'm sorry, uh, Ruvain. You think Ruvain slept with his father's wife? That's not what happened. Okay? But anyway, I am considered a sinner only to you. Ve'eneni tzarich zulosi lemchiloscha. And I only need your forgiveness. I don't need to go to another human being for forgiveness. That's not what happened. Because if I would have sinned to another human being, if I, if the sin I did involved another human being, another person, I would have already asked him and I would have appeased him. So this is what King David is saying. If it was, this is, the, this is how it's done. And I surely would have done that. Well, it, I didn't. I didn't sin against another human being. I don't need to do this. But if I would have, that's what I would have done. Therefore, it's against 
you alone that I sinned. Chatasi, that I sinned. But what does that mean? It means like, you alone, I'm considered a sinner. Only to you, God, I'm a sinner. The Gemara actually tells us, if you think David sinned with Bathsheba, you're making a great mistake. But he did sin. He even said, I sinned. The question is, what was that sin? So he says, Kamohu, it's similar to the Chatasi La'avi Kol Hayamim. Go to Genesis chapter 4, verse 32. Okay. So Yehuda is in a very precarious situation, right? He wanted Binyamin to come down. He put his life as a guarantor. Um, you know, Yaakov was not happy about this uh, situation of having uh, Yosef. Uh, I'm sorry, Yosef was already gone. So he didn't know Yosef was alive or not, but he didn't want to leave his, lose his beloved, bin, um, his beloved Binyamin. Okay. So Yehuda put his life down basically as collateral. Right? And he says in chapter 44, 32, For your servant assumed responsibility for the boy from my father, saying, If I do not bring him to you, if I don't bring him back, I will have sinned against my father forever. It doesn't mean he's a continual sinner, but as if he would be looked at as a sinner in, in his father's eyes. So that's the comparison over there. Um... But we have read, right? Then I will sin to my father for all time, which doesn't mean that, but rather, Al Chet Hazeh Echashev Chote Etzel Avi Kol Hayamin. I will be considered a sinner by my father for all time. Kilazot Lo Yislachli, meaning that he would not forgive me as long as he lives. He'll continuously look at me as a sinner. And the uh, Targum explains basically the same, the same thing. Now, Rabbeinu Yon offers another interpretation of King David's words. Okay? This is the author of our book, right? Rabbeinu, Rabbeinu Yon. When it says, Lecha levodecha chatasi, to you alone I sinned, O ye pirusho, the alternative explanation is, Lo chatasi leish, I never sinned against another man. To you alone I sinned, I never sinned against another human being. Lo I never even oppressed another man with words. I never spoke Lashon Hara. I never used my words to degrade anybody. I never took anything from another human being. And I never um, stole any property that I needed forgiveness for. And therefore, my atonement it, um, depends on nothing other than your forgiveness. That's it. Because I did everything in my power, whatever I could do, to do tshuva, I did. And it, of course, it includes prayer. It includes vidoy, um, confession. Everything beyond the letter of the law as well. I'll just read his words. Thus, my atonement depends on nothing other than your forgiveness of my sin against you. In any event, it's clear that when David recited Vidoy, when he actually confessed about his sin against Hashem, he was not guilty of any sin against a fellow, either because he had already appeased anyone he had aggrieved, or because he never grieved anyone. This is the proper way to approach Vidoy. When you're finally going to come to Hashem, have under your belt already. Have already accomplished whatever it is that you need to do. Rabbeinu Yona proceeds to explain the second half of the verse. Lama'an. Remember I mentioned the word Lama'an. So going back to this would be Psalms 51.6. When it says, so that you will be charitable when you speak and meritorious when you judge. What is this referring to? Laman titztak bidavrecha tiske bishaftecha. He says like this. 
Kedei laharos la'amim. This is crazy what he's about to say. But we have precedence, right? There's nothing new under the sun. If King David did it, maybe he was the first, but we actually do have precedence. In order to show the people, he wanted to teach Am Yisrael. How great and mighty Hashem's forgiveness is. <clears throat> I sinned against you, he's saying, in order to show the nations, the world, your charity, your kindness, basically, and the great extents of your forgiveness. Um, to the great extent, great extent of your forgiveness on the day that you speak and judge, when you judge me. Okay. I'm going to show you the precedence. What was he doing? He wanted the world to know there's such a thing as tshuva. Listen, he wasn't the first. Even his predecessor, Yehuda, Yehuda, he says, I, I, she's more righteous than me. He publicly, right? And not only did Yehuda do that, but somewhere in between in history, we have, um, what was the case I wanted to bring? I have here a note. Um, oh, yeah. The one who collected wood in the desert. Okay? This was none other than Salathchat. His daughters came and said, we want a piece of the land. Right? A piece of the action in Eretz Israel. We don't have someone to inherit from. He's already gone. But he died for his own sin. He was not part of the, the rebellion of Korach. But the Talmud, the, the uh, Medrash, the Sifri, the Sfra, all kinds of commentaries, comments are made about it. And that... We all knew that there's a death penalty. There is a death penalty for violating Shabbat. It was clear, clear in the Torah. But which death penalty? You know that if you give a warning to somebody and it's not the right warning, right? You say to somebody, you're going to get stoned and really it's strangulation or it's um, lashes or whatever it is, that's called not a warning. The warning has to be, do you know what you're doing? This is the punishment. And if you do it, this is what you're going to get. And the person goes ahead and does it anyway. Okay, so if you give them the wrong, wrong warning. So this person, apparently, as I'm going to show you, knew that it was too vague. It was too ambiguous. Nobody knew the exact details because it didn't happen yet. So he was like a, a Corbin. He almost, he did a sin for the sake of heaven. Can you imagine? He put his life on the line so that everyone would keep Shabbos properly in the desert. I'll read the, uh, the idea here. So who was this guy, and what was his sin? Rabbi Kiva mentions it was Salafchad. And what was his sin? So we're, we're not even sure. It was plucking or heaping or carrying four cubits within a public domain. Okay. What was his intentions? We call it a sin, L'shem Shemayim. A straightforward reading suggests that his wood cutting was an act of rebellion against Shabbat. You read it, and that's what you think. But some Midrashim, including the Targum Yonatan, insist that the Makoshesh acted the Shem Shemayim for the sake of heaven in noble self sacrifice to show the Jewish people that Shabbat must be observed and, of course, what punishment, what proper punishment, and uh, what exactly what the sin was. Okay, so, this, so there's a precedence. King David won. Now, did he really want to in the beginning or after the fact? He realized, wow, so I sinned. I'm going to do tshuva, and I'm going to make this lesson valuable to the Jewish people. I think, I think it's the latter. I don't think it means that he intended from the very beginning in order to do this, like the Makoshesh did. And I don't think Yehuda did either. But... Let's read on and we'll see how the, the Rebbeinu Yon explains it. So, David uses the expression, right? Lashon lama'an, in order. What is the, in order? What does that mean, in order? Remember, he said, to you alone did I sin so that, I'm just translating in order, but really, so that you will be charitable. Meaning, in order to show the nations your charity, because of the greatness of the sin he committed, 
is what causes the greatness of Hashem's charity toward him to be revealed when he forgives him. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about an example, another example in history shortly. But Al Kain Yimshul Davar. So there's a um, an analogy towards this idea. This is, is this is what David wants to portray. As if the sin, as if, because it wasn't really, as if the sin were originally committed by him in order that Hashem's kindness and charity should be revealed when he forgives the sin on his day of judgment. Okay, let me just read comment number seven. So it's obvious, obviously, David did not commit the sin with the lofty intention of creating an opportunity for Hashem to forgive him, and thus to bring out Hashem's kindness. But once he sinned, that kindness would be revealed by Hashem forgiving David. That's what happened. And since it is so, David portrays it as if he sinned in order to reveal that kindness. Example... The revelation of Hashem's kindness is ultimately a positive outcome of the sin. So in that sense, it can be called purpose. In other words, Laman, for the purpose of, in order that, right? That's what Dovin meant. Now that it happened, I will use whatever it is that I, I, you know, that's what a sin is, a mistake, and I will use it for the benefit of mankind and let mankind know how kind Hashem is. And um, now the example is in Hosea, Hosea, Hosea chapter eight, verse four, right? These people used um, their gold, their silver. The people of the north, Israel, Ephraim, whatever you want to call it, up north, the, the the house of Israel up north, and um, you know it was destroyed. So what was destroyed? These idols were made of gold and silver, but it was really the gold and silver that was destroyed. What, you know, they had a lot of wealth, and they used it wrongly. So their wealth was destroyed, which was a good thing. So let's look at it. With, let's, how, let's look at the verse. It says over there, they set up a king, but not for me. Right? God is saying, they removed, and I did not know. With their silver and their gold, they made for themselves idols. In order, the same word, lama'an, that it should be cut off. In order that what should be cut off? The gold and silver. Okay. Let's see how the Rabbeinu Yon explains this. So a similar usage in that verse, we just read the verse. From their silver and gold they made for themselves idols, so that, Laman, it would be eliminated. Now did they actually attend, in, was that their in initial intent, that their silver and gold should be eliminated? No, not necessarily, but rather, Mibneki asiat but since the sin of making idols is what ultimately caused their silver and gold to be eliminated, so the prophet portrays the matter as if they as if they originally made those idols in order that the silver and gold would be eliminated. Here too. This is the lesson. David's sin would ultimately cause Hashem's charity to be revealed and, his, and by his forgiving him. David portrays it as if he sinned in order for his, God's charity, to be revealed. Now, just keep in mind, this was David's way of begging Hashem for forgiveness. This is all part of, and actually it's going to be what we're going to talk about next week in uh, Paragraph 46. Let's just finish 45, and then we'll take questions and have some discussions. And so he continues this idea when it says, Laman titztak, right, in order to show your charity through your words, that you uh, will, you know, be meritorious in your judgment. So, oh yeah, pirusho, another explanation, an alternative explanation as follows. So remember, David said, against you alone did I sin, and that which is evil in your eyes did I do. Laman zeh. Therefore, this, titzdak, you, God, would be justified should you speak about the subject. 
למען זה תצטרך בדברך על פקודה והשילום. Meaning like this. Therefore you would be justified should you speak about the subject of judging me and imposing compensation or punishment on me. Okay, I want to read number 10. According to this interpretation, the word lema'an does not mean so that, but rather therefore, as titzdak would rather mean not charitable, but justifiable. And therefore, David says, my sin is severe, and therefore you would be justified in judging me and meritorious in punishing me should you choose to do so. But of course, Hashem didn't. The same interpretation can be given for the other verse uh, that we use in, in Hosea, Hosea. For their silver, from their silver and gold, they made themselves idols. Laman, so that it would be eliminated. Again, don't read it as so that, but rather justified. Right? Um, Laman, it means therefore it will be eliminated because they made idols from their silver and gold it will be eliminated. Okay, so that is the, 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 the text that we're dealing with. I think we went through all the different um, sources. I just want to see if I had any comments that I might have skipped. I think I covered it all. Okay, so what we do now, we take questions and answers online. I'm going to turn the camera off, and before we do that, before we do so, we'll see you all next week. Again, if anybody wants to join us on live online, so that you can have this discussion afterwards, you can, in, in the description box below, there is a WhatsApp number. Send us a message. We'll send you all the information, and uh, in the meantime, have a great life. We'll see you next week. <laughs>